and welcome to The Piping Show, coming to you from the National Piping Centre in Glasgow, Scotland. I'm Andrew Bova, and delighted to be your host this week. This week, I'm excited to be joined by not one, but two guests, Fiona Dixon and Katrina McPherson, daughters of the famous Donald McPherson. For our viewers, Donald McPherson may need no introduction, but for those who might not know, Donald McPherson was a prolific composer, performer, teacher, and is perhaps best known as one of the winningest solo competitors of all time. If you enjoy this content, please be sure to like and subscribe, and if you are so inclined, please share it on social media so that we can reach other pipers all around the world. I'm very much looking forward to bringing you my interview with Fiona and Katrina later on, but for now, let's go to Helen Urquhart for this week's News in Piping. Last week, the Northern Meetings took place on Thursday and Friday in Inverness. The winners were Angus McCall, who won the CLASP, Alex Gandy, who won the former winner's MSR. In a first for piping, his father was also in the prize list, and we think this is the first time that a father and son have ever ended up in the same list together at one of the senior events. William Rowe from New Zealand won the silver medal. Nick Hudson won this year's gold medal. He then had to make a sharp exit home with his wife going into labour on the same day as he won the, his gold medal. We were delighted to hear of the safe arrival of his new baby and we wish them all the very best. The National Piping Centre's weekend piping club started on Saturday past. If you have pipers aged 17 and under who would like to take part, there's still time to sign up. So head over to the National Piping Centre website to find out more. The Competition League for Amateur Solo Pipers weekend workshops have now been launched. Registrations are now open over at their website www.theclasp.co.uk. This weekend is open to all amateur pipers and will take place on the 7th and 8th of October. Now for what is obviously the best part of the show, this week's history segment with yours truly. Hello there. The last two weeks have seen us return to some of piping's most prestigious competitions, those being the Northern Meeting at Inverness and the Argyllshire Gathering at Oban. Both of these competitions feature a gold medal competition, sponsored by the Highland Society of London, with the Inverness gold medal going back to 1859 and the Oban gold medal going back to 1873. I thought today we'd take a look back at some previous winners of these prestigious events. In 1922, Donald Chisholm of the Highland Light Infantry, a brigade we can't seem to escape on these history segments at the moment, won the gold medal at Inverness. In that same year, Robert Reed, also of the Highland Light Infantry, won the gold medal at Oban. Now, unfortunately, we don't have either of the gold medals from that particular year, but we do have Robert Reed's gold medal from Inverness in 1921, which we can see here. Robert Reed won the gold medal in 1921, playing McLeod of Rassay's Salute. Robert Reed went on to win six clasps at the Northern Meeting, three of which we have here, 1922, 1925, and 1926. He would go on to win again in 1931, 1935, and 1946. These competitions have been going since they were started with the exception of, like the World Pipe Band Championships, World War I, World War II, and the last two years with the global pandemic. Again, over the last two weeks, we've returned to these competitions, and I would like to give a warm congratulations to Jamie Forrester, who won the gold medal at Oban, and my friend Nick Hudson, who just won the gold medal at Inverness. Congratulations, gentlemen, on joining the Pibrach Pantheon. If you'd like to see these medals, they're on display in the National Piping Centre Museum thanks to the kind generosity of Robert Reed's grandson, Robin Bauer. Our little foul friend, Chanter McDuck, has been away adventuring again. Let's find out where they've been.
Now let's go to my conversation with Fiona Dixon and Katrina McPherson, daughters of the legendary Donald McPherson. Well, Fiona, Katrina, thank you so much for coming in and joining me today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to the National Piping Centre to speak about your father. I think where I'd, what I'd like to start is, unfortunately, there's, there's quite a few young pipers today who never got to meet your father. Um, I would include myself in that, uh, except I don't know that I would call myself particularly young anymore. Um, and I was wondering, for those of us who never had the good fortune to meet Donald, could you tell us a little bit about what he was like as a person? I think first and foremost he was a perfectionist. Yes, he was. Perfectionist in, in everything. everything. Not just his playing, his performances and so on, but certainly in his day-to-day -day life he was very much had to be just perfect. Um, so yes, I, I think his preparation for the big events was, was important to him, wasn't it? Yes, very much so. But very humble. He didn't modest. really... Modest. Modest, yes. Um, I think he would have been embarrassed about all this too. He would have said, oh, what fuss? Shouldn't be making such a fuss about it, you know, but uh, that was the way he was, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, you know, you've spoken about the the music and sort of the perfectionism. Uh, I'm curious, what was the what was the role of music in your home growing up? It was always there, always. Whether it was piping or or piano or mm. singing or singing. Yes, we used to have lots of good fun at Christmas times and yeah. Kayleys. You just ad hoc, wasn't it really? Um, yes, it was good fun. I used to play the, the accordion oh, and we just get you. together and play mostly pipe band music, or pipe tunes. Um, duets on the piano. Duets on the piano, and singing, yes, it was always there. Dad liked the harmonica as well. Yes, so he was a very good player. Yes. I think maybe a lot of people wouldn't know that, you know, your father was an instrumentalist beyond pipes. Mm -hmm. and am I correct in saying he'd spent a spell as a classical pianist? Yes, yes, yes. And are you, are you also a, yes, a, yes, a professional yes. pianist? Yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's my stock and trade, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I've been a music teacher for oh, 40, I was going to say 40 years, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe <laughs> longer than that. Um, but as a piano teacher, latterly. Uh, yes, in fact, Dad taught us to play the piano. Um, that was really because when we were growing up, although we wanted to play the bagpipes, he wouldn't teach us. Why was that? And that was because at that time, girls weren't allowed to compete with the boys. And he said, there would be no point in trying to teach you. He said, I could make you the best pipers in the world, but nobody would ever know, so there's no point. So he taught us the piano instead. It was me, I was desperate yes. to, to learn how to play the pipes. And I used to say, please, please teach me, but no, he wouldn't. No, no point. Did you? Um, sorry. We, we, sorry, we did, um, we carried on with piano. And then I went to, I've carried on with the studies up to what was then the Royal Scottish Academy of Music, um, but is now, as you know, the Conservatoire. Um, and from then we just carried on with our music playing in, in some form or other, whether it was in teaching or performing. Um, for me, it was just for my pleasure. I, I didn't like performing in front of anybody, so piano was purely for me to enjoy yeah. for myself. And Dad enjoyed playing for himself as well. It's very good. We used to play duets with them. Was it 1940s and 50s music? 30s and 40s. It's great fun. Great fun. I was just about to ask, what type of repertoire did you play? Um, well, as we were learning, it would be the sort of classics, if you like, um, back with the studies and scales and so on. Although well, I wasn't very good at practicing. <laughs> well, as most young people aren't. <laughs> probably, um, it was like Dad. He didn't practice. He only prepared for the big events. He really. wasn't playing non-stop every every day of the week or sort anything. Of he would just say, um, oh, Inverness is coming up, perhaps we should <laughs> make a start. Pipes out. <laughs> and, pipes out. and he would do a lot of his preparation, not on the pipes, but um, you know, just reading the books and the music. Um, learned everything that way, I think, first of all. And then on to the practice chapters, and then that was the way he did it. So <coughs> when, when Donald was learning music, would he, would he sing the music yes. before, yes. before he even yes. got the chanter out? Yeah. I do remember him saying at one point, um, because it was his father, uh, our granddad Ian, who taught her. And uh, he'd said that on this one occasion his dad had told him some particular movement or a, a, was it a tune perhaps? It was, it was a tune, yeah. And said, um, when you're finished and when you're complete, come back and I'll take you on to the next stage. And dad went back after an hour and said, I'm finished. You can't possibly have done it in that time. And he had. He'd memorised it in that time because he was a quick learner. So, 
fact, we should say that he really didn't start out as a piper. He wanted to be a drummer. Really? <laughs> in the pipe band. Well, how lucky for us that that yeah, didn't pan yes, out. Yeah, so he, was, he had a foot in both camps, I think, for a wee while. But uh, well, that was our background, I suppose, in mm. that, yeah. So, you know, you, you've talked a little bit about <clears throat> sort of his, you hinted at his preparation for competitions. Mm. And I'm sure that the people at home would be very curious to know about what his attitude was like towards piping. You know, was he quite intense about it or relaxed? What was it like when he when he was getting ready for competitions? I think he was probably within his own bubble, wasn't he? Um, you know, we, we all we knew he was preparing and getting ready for events, but he would take himself off and be you know, privately working on something. I suppose it was quite intense because he didn't have a lot of time to prepare, <laughs> and he didn't. You know, he was not very great person to be practicing as such it was as he just going over the tunes as he used to say. I think he was always very conscious of the neighbours too. He didn't yes. want to annoy anybody with the, the noise of the bagpipes. Especially very nice noise. Yes, <laughs> especially when we were living down in England. He said it's it's foreign for me, didn't want to to disturb them and upset them. In fact <laughs> when we were living in Devon for a while, um, he actually built a soundproof box in one of the bedrooms, and he would go in there so that he wouldn't disturb anybody. That's, that's uh, far more uh, conscious of neighbours than I am in my flat in Partick. Um, Most of the neighbours didn't know he was a piper until an article appeared in the, the local mm -hmm. newspaper. That's right. What, uh, what took you down to England? I'd read that he, well, your family spent a spell mm -hmm. living down, down south. I think Dad's philosophy was that he could, his trade was a um, precision engineer and you could be a precision engineer in any part of the country. So um, we went back down to, to Wiltshire first of all. Um, That's where Mum was from. That's right. And right. went back to sort of her roots if you like for a while. And uh, then later on, um, we or Dad had another post down in Exmouth in Devon. And he said, what a wonderful place, you know, to be out to be able to enjoy the, the sunshine and the fresh air. But of course that did take him away from the piping scene. Um, it was just that wee bit harder to come back up to compete because of the, the travel and the, the costs, I suppose, involved in that as well. It was in Ex Exmouth that Dad started to make his own wreaths. Yes. Uh, yes, that's right. All right. That's where he did that. Mm -hmm. Now, you've, you've mentioned sort of this perfectionism and, and whatnot. Um, your father is widely regarded as, you know, having one of the best bagpipes of all time and sort of changing the game in terms of what's expected yes. of, of a <clears throat> piper's mm -hmm. pipe. Um, I'm curious if you have any insight onto what it was about him that allowed him to achieve something that seemed unachievable mm -hmm. in his time. I think he had a particular sound in his head. He, yes. he knew what it would be to be perfect. Um, and he had that, that the brightness of tone. So uh, as you'll know, originally I think pipes were set about A in the A key. <coughs> he, no, excuse me. Um, but Dad's tone just a wee bit brighter was different. So it's now I think accepted that the key is now B flat. So it makes it a bit awkward when you're trying to accompany <laughs> and you're reading pipe music, which is still as it was, but it sounds like. Of course, we're not experts in, in playing so. <laughs> Well, but I quite that background in classical music. Yes. Um, now, uh, I do want to. I want to speak. There's some things here to speak about that you've brought along that I think our viewers would be very interested to see. Um, I think a good place to start speaking about his competitive career would be this little gem of a book here. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've yes, brought? Yes, certainly. Um, this little book here um, is a complete record of all the competitions that Dad entered. Um, and each page would tell you the title of the, the competition he was in, the date, the names of the judges, the pieces, the, the, the tunes that he was going to play, um, the Peabrooks, the, maybe there was four or five that were on uh, to be learned that year, maybe which one he played on the day. There would be comments about how he played. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and also a list of the, the prizes that he had won, and, and the money too. And here, <clears throat> for, he got one pound in expenses for that competition at Cowell in 1949, <laughs> um, and eight pounds for the first prize there. 
So there you go. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of writing in there. In fact, Dad had always said if there was a fire in the house, this was the first thing you had to save before everything else. Not his bagpipes. This is the record of work. All the documentation is there. So we've looked after all this time. <laughs> it's, it's treasured. <laughs> well, I, I am looking forward to when we're finished here having a wee thumb through it and getting to <laughs> Thank you. Um, getting a little look into some of that piping history. Um, now, you've also brought some photographs along with you. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe show us some of those yes, of and, and, and talk a little bit about them. Um, as you can imagine, he, he played pipes and right through to his 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, he was well into his 80s. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of photographs, as you can imagine. So what I tried to do was just to find a few that might highlight certain decades, if you like. Um, and that one, uh, there's Dad there. He's playing with the Shepherd Pipe Band. Oh, that was right, his, yeah. his first pipe band, if you like. So Did I? I'm sure I've read a story about um, he had his arm injured, yes. and then he was, he was in the hospital, and he heard a recording of the Shepherd Pipe Band, and he threw his arms up, and it was it sort was of a, a speedy recovery from there. I think Dad said it wasn't quite like that, but yes, <laughs> he did hear the, the, his uh, pipe band and said, that was my, my pipe band. I don't know if he was able to lift his arm, but he did always have a, a damaged arm, didn't he? Yeah. he did. It was kind of slightly bent there. It was always a bit hard for him so, um, with certain bags to uh, position himself, but... It, it came through that, he would always find a way around things. Mm -hmm. was, same with his, same with his, um, in his own, uh, his, his personal life, if he was making something um, and he didn't have the right tool, he would make it, because he would, that was his, his job. He would always find a way around things. Yeah. He was very clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was just obviously one of the very first, um, uh, in fact, on the back there, it's very, it's very faded. But it looks like it was his mum that had got it done. We will to read that later. Right. Um, most of these photographs, unfortunately, are in black and white. But then that's what we had. <laughs> Sign of the time. Yes. I think he was just in his thirties, there, looking very serious. Um, and in this one, we were in uh, Wiltshire, and <clears throat> excuse me, it's just I think actually I remember. About this time, um, I have more memories um, of Dad. He'd obviously competed in London, and as a youngster, we would be in bed before he would get home. This is the days before mobile phones to let us know how it got on. Even ordinary phones. Oh, sorry, I just <laughs> <thought we'd laughs> so and uh, when we got back home uh, got in the evening after he'd obviously been out for the day, and I came down in the morning and I saw this on the table. It was a sort of tissue paper with a, a blue, f oh, I thought it was a flag. I didn't know what it was. I thought, well, he must have won something again. <laughs> it was the brother of Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but I do remember it was on the kitchen table in that house that we were in in, in um, Wiltshire at the time. And it's the two of you here? Yes, that's, that's me there and Katrina on the outside. Cute as buttons. <laughs> it's a lovely family yes. photograph. I'm quite happy there. And then slightly later, as you can see, you know, um, that's Dad in Inverness. There's a river nest behind us. Um, it's myself, sorry, and Katrina on that side. After they'd one there. <coughs> lovely. Very and lovely. I think actually the next one is very similar in that it's it's a family photograph of his mum as well. Oh, and very nice. uh, Katrina on the right, myself on the left, with our white McPherson tartan right. skirts and matching ties. <laughs> it's lovely to see what a family man he was. Yes. Oh, yes. Very he much. So. Very much so. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, is this after after one of the major contests? Um, or? No, I think, well, it might well have been um, the Piper Above All Pipers, uh, Glasgow, uh, the Provost Piper uh, competition. You won, you won it twice, actually. Uh, I, I like that one. I think that, that's how I remember Dad most. With, Mum always preferred the Balmoral to, to the Glengarry. She was never <laughs> very keen on the Glengarry. No, I don't know why. Yeah, I like that one. Um, so I'm sort of going through the, the decades, yeah. if you like. This was taken on a, a trip uh, to New Zealand. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the picture that Austin Campbell, who's a very famous um, uh, painter, author, and director, film director in Scotland, um, he asked permission, could he use this photograph to do a portrait? And he used that photograph. That didn't sit for it. It was just the photograph he used. 
and now the oil painting is in the McPherson Museum, uh, hanging nicely in the yeah. newly refurbished. In fact, it's reopening in August, isn't it? Where is that? Newton 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 so it's up, it's hanging up, it's a big painting, but it's lovely. And we've got some lovely letters from Austin Campbell to Dad saying, you know, that it's coming on nicely, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, so it's, it's nice, some background to it. Um, and this was when we were in Bear's Den. Um, I'm not sure why it was taken, I'm not sure. But it, again, unfortunately, it's in black and white. Um, I think this was... That's a picture of him getting his BEM. Oh my, yeah. That was in 1986. And it was at that point he was living in Wales. <laughs> Quite the world. Well, <laughs> UK traveller at least, yeah. Um, that was after he'd retired, took early retirement and lived in Wales. Um, so it was given to them by the, the um, Lord Lieutenant of the county. Um, so it was quite an event. We were all there for that. And these two here, more informal ones, because he was in Sardinia. I like that's one of my favourites I've had. And with mm -hmm. mum as well. Um, I think he was recording music for the, the Living Legend, wasn't he? With yes. Barnaby Steve. Brown. Yeah. Mm. So, and the last and one, just for to go on to, um, you can see he's, although he's aged, he still looks like probably the Donald person that a lot of people will remember because yeah. of that age. In fact, in this wee one here, it says, it says, on writing, Pembroke Society Tutorials, February 92. So it's him in a bit more casual dress with his practice <laughs> chatter there. That's all. And I think yeah, you, for our maybe American viewers oh. might find our last photo here yes, quite interesting. As it says here, it's the Great Seal of the State of Oklahoma, 1907. Um, because Dad, obviously, had travelled abroad quite a lot, giving mm -hmm. talks. And, master classes and performances and so on. And this photograph here is signed by the governor. Um, thank you, Mr. McPherson, for giving uh, us for giving us your beautiful music. We hope you enjoyed your visit to our great state. With best wishes, David Walters, Governor of Oklahoma, 921-92. Of course, then, uh, you will know this, that the dates are slightly altered. Yeah. So, Yes, it wasn't the 21st month at all. <laughs> that's, that's a bit, oops, back the picture there. Receiving this particular mm. piece. Well, that's, sure. that's lovely. Mm. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's, it's always such a pleasure to get to see those sort of family photos of, you know, people that somebody like myself would know just through recordings yes, or, yes. you know, pictures through piping. Um, it certainly helps all of us to get to know the yes, person the man behind the a little bit better, yeah. So you've, you've brought in this book of, of manuscript um, with some of Donald's tunes and I was thumbing through it earlier and there's some, there's some incredible, incredible music in here um, that we would all know things like, you know, a tune like the Curlew, which is standard repertoire, it's one of the jigs that everybody knows. Um, but I did notice that your tune is in here as well, um, right. Katrina Bannister. That's right. Um, so, oh, is yours in here as well? I must have missed that when I was swimming through it earlier. Um, but these tunes are also published in this book, The, the, Living, the, Li the Legend Lives On. Um, now, I understand that this was sort of an endeavor of the both of yours yes. and uh, self-published. Can you maybe just tell us quickly about you know, why you went about publishing this book? Well, it was after um, Dad passed away, we found his original manuscript book, and it was Mum as well. She, yes, she, she was keen wasn't. to have a record of all his tunes in the one book, because although some of them had been published over the years, not all of them had been. And in fact, there are a few um, in, in the book, in his manuscript book, that um, didn't even have a title. So we worked together, didn't we, the yes. three of us, yes. um, to, to bring them all together into the one book. And Mum named the tunes that had been unnamed, and we pulled it all together. And we had a, a think about the, the stories that went behind the, the titles of the tunes, <coughs> made it into a nice little caption at the bottom of the photographs that went along with yes. Yes. the tunes. And so we asked Jennifer Hutchin, who was one of Dad's pupils, <coughs> excuse me, 
if she would be kind enough to translate, if you like, the written, the handwritten music into what people would be more used to today, I suppose, computerised version of it. So we have on one side, we've got the original, and then we've got the more up-to-date version of it. <coughs> As you see, photographs to highlight each of the, the, the titles and so on. So the picture uh, you were talking about uh, between Katrina uh, Bannister and Fiona Dixon, um, there's a picture of a family wedding, so you can see his old mum and dad and so on. So. Owning a copy myself, I would highly recommend it. If you're curious to learn more about Donald McPherson and his life and get a little bit more of a view into who he was as a person and the story behind some of his music. Unfortunately, I would, I would happily sit here and <laughs> chat away with you for hours and keep picking your brains and asking you questions, but I think that will have to bring us to time. So, Fiona, Katrina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for inviting us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching The Piping Show. I have been and will continue to be Andrew Bova. And to round us out this week, I'll play you Donald McPherson's classic tune, The Curlew. Thank <laughs> you.